Uh, welcome to our podcast again. This is my, this is our 14th uh, episode, and I have someone really special here for me. I respect a lot this guy, uh, Craig Douglas. Uh, he is, uh, in my opinion, the best uh, close self-defense uh, with weapons, you know, uh, knife, guns. And all this scenario, even like inside a car right now, like you, yeah. I heard like you're studying. More we were doing that, that before the Russians were. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Many, many years ago. <laughs> we were. Man, but uh, yeah. So, and also I have Brian here. Uh, he works in the SWAT team in San Diego, California. Uh, one of my black belts uh, for me. Brian is the best cop I ever met. <laughs> He's very responsible. Uh, trains every day. He's fit. And his lifestyle is to protect and help the community. So, yeah, so I'll let you guys, like, introduce yourself. So, sure. starting with uh, Professor Craig. Yeah, I'm, I'm Craig Douglas. I'm a, a retired uh, sheriff's deputy. I had a 21-year career. I've been a martial artist since I was a child. I've done every mostly silly martial art you could mm -hmm. probably do and i uh, had uh, most of them fail and, and got into combat sports and then through the course of my career and looking at combat sports and some some fairly significant failures i had in uh working undercover narcotics i kind of had to put together something that worked and then having a teacher's I, as I was an academy instructor for many, many years, 22 years, it invariably developed into a self-defense system that I that became a second career, and I teach now. Uh, this is my 20th year teaching on the road, and I teach in um, 47 states, 11 countries outside of the U.S., all branches of the U.S. military, uh, five federal law enforcement agencies, and some other government agencies. So, um, yeah, it's a great career, and been doing this for a long time, and Still uh, am curious and still unsure of myself if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Come on, Professor. No, that's true. It's true. Yeah, because you got to have an open mind. Huh? Yeah. You got to keep learning you have every to. day, improving. You have right? to. Yes. And yeah. we have Brian here, Brian Frias. Yeah, this is the third time coming here to third talk with time, you. Yeah. And uh, I know the very first time it was a lot about, we had a lot of stuff going on with police and the news, and it was... Uh, very humbling that you would come out and speak with me about our perspective and let me get that out to whoever's willing to listen. A lot of cops out there, they want to do better than they're afforded to. And it takes a, a lot of personal effort and sacrifice to make that happen. A lot of cities aren't going to support the monetarily the requirement it takes to develop a good, strong officer who's competent handling themselves physically out there. So but the guys who are out there training, seeking training on their own, I want to encourage them. And for me, I, I started with with the, the Marine Corps doing all of their self-defense thing, mm -hmm. thinking I was good at it. And then I got into the, the sport jujitsu world and came out here meeting you. And then I thought I was amazing at that, which in turn made me think I was really good at self-defense, then became a cop and uh, a user of all of this and realized I wasn't that great and then uh, was able to go to one of his courses and when I came back, I was like, this is it. Bridging the gap between all of your technical information and execution and his scenario mindset and how to, how to use that within the real world, I, I feel like that is the, the key to success out there in the world. And I like uh, when we had Asa, it was, it's interesting you have kind of the, the leading edge of the, the sport jiu-jitsu world. You have the, the very polished development of self-defense techniques and then myself as an active user of the system going out every day and, and pressure testing this in the real world. How, yeah. how do I communicate well with the public to avoid the fight? And sometimes you can't, so how do I perform within the fight? And it's cool to have both of your minds feeding people like me out there. So hopefully everyone gets a lot out of it. And oh, it's going to be yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> Professor, uh, you start uh, teaching self-defense um, back in the 90s, huh? Or not? Yeah. So I was a, I'll give you the quick and uh, it's not that quick actually. So I started uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> it's a long career, Professor. Uh, yeah, it is. I'm an old guy. <laughs> More salt and pepper these days. <laughs> I, uh, I started as a kid 
training in martial arts, like most kids who started in training in martial arts, because I was uh, the you know skinny runty kid. I was Daniel Larusso getting beat up and uh, <laughs> chased around by the Cobra Kai guys. <laughs> so I, I started in Taekwondo uh, as that was the only thing available. Nineteen seventy four. I was six oh, years wow. old. I'm fifty. I'm fifty three now. And um, it was the only thing around. So I did that, and and then it became just a passion. I got into uh, Aikido and Aikijitsu in my teenage years, and then went in the Army, um, came out of the Army. While, while I was in the Army, started doing uh, some Kali Salat Muay Thai, and that was what was trendy back then in the late 80s. Got exposed to um, Shuto with uh, Eric Paulson and Yori Nakamura. I did a little bit of Judo as a teenager. And my first exposure to Brazilian jiu-jitsu was at a Machado seminar in 1993. Mm. That was the first time I was exposed before to Before UFC, huh? Yeah, prior to the, before. it was right before the UFC. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was uh, still doing a little bit of grappling and I was a police officer. I'd come on in 1990 and uh, the first two years were in the jail. So there was a lot of manhandling and grappling and uh, being the martial arts nerd, I had a really good rear naked choke. Um, for the era and when I first came on within like six months I choked an inmate unconscious and that was like magic to everyone there at the facility so hey how do we do that and then they started sending me to schools to become a formal police defense tactics instructor wow. so I started training police officers in an academy environment in 1992 and I did that until a year after I retired in uh, 2012 and then the self-defense stuff came after a few assignments from corrections into patrol in under, undercover narcotics, a two-year undercover assignment, wow. where I had some, some fairly significant failures of all of my martial arts. And it really caused me to reevaluate what I was doing and how I was doing. There were, there were a couple of instances that, that almost cost me my life that were close quarters, you know, self-defense environments. And... Um, there wasn't just any. There wasn't anything out there that was appropriate for me as a police officer, so I, I started doing basically things I had seen uh, in the early days of the UFC mm -hmm. in cars with guns and knives. Well, we used simunition guns, which are like paintball guns, and you know, uh, really not having any direction and not knowing what we're doing, other than I thought that competition and what I was seeing and what we called no holds barred at the time in the early days of the UFC, I thought that was an interesting laboratory to kind of look at some of these problems that I'd had. And it, it led to some end states that worked that I realized combat sports were a really good pathway to get to these end states that we had figured out in our local fight club. Because in the very beginning, we just had a bunch of young dudes and we got the equipment and we put on motorcycle helmets and, and MMA gloves and took Sims guns and training knives and got in cars and honestly just wow. beat the shit out of each other. I mean, that was, it. there was, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was fight club. It wow. was. And I, I had a good enough eye to be able to start to, look at okay why didn't that work why does that work why why is this seem to work more consistently and, and what i found was okay you know what, what for example what does it take in a clinch or a ground fight to produce a firearm because every best practice in close quarter shooting in my era was okay if you're in a close quarters environment and you have to shoot a guy you should somehow or another karate your way out yeah break range and get to the gun mm -hmm. and that can work it has worked until you can't get loose yeah. okay yeah. somebody's really locked onto you or as i found um you're in a vehicle fighting over a gun and there is no place to go so there were there were no strategies or tactics or techniques or best practices i mean not only did not only was none of that available the training modalities mm -hmm. were not available. We didn't even know how to train content yeah. like that. Yeah. So literally had to start from ground zero. And just after a few years of that, realizing, okay, 
uh, Jiu Jitsu modified, wrestling modified, are are fairly consistent, tidy ways to be able to get the gun out. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't have any intention of of teaching outside of local in my own agency. And I just started writing uh, online and interacting and um, in self-defense forums, you know, which was pre-social media and there was an interest Mm -hmm. and uh, people liked what I had to say. And then uh, some products came about that people wanted my input on and that led to interest in me doing a class. And the first open enrollment class I did was here in Southern California in 2003, it was a ninth class. And it was, there was interest, people asked, and it just went from there. More people asked, and people wrote about it, and I was like, okay. And a- after eight years, I guess, of brand building, mm-hmm. I realized, oh, wow, I can actually make a living doing this, and I really like doing it. Yeah. And it, um, it re-energized me to instructorship and teaching because up to that point, I was only really teaching law enforcement and largely law enforcement is a, as we were talking about earlier, earlier, a fairly disinterested, ambivalent population. Mm-hmm. So when you compare that group and you want to put your heart and soul into something and they just, you know, don't really care about it. And then you have this group of people who train harder and work harder and will go longer, you know, than a bunch of guys who are tough guys who carry guns and it's their job to be competent in self-defense, defend themselves, defend others. Well, yeah, those people brought out the best in me and they just pushed my instructorship and pushed my content well beyond anything, you know, that I would have imagined as a, you know, mostly small town police officer. So that's wow. that's the story, man. And uh, I stay busy now. I was on the road uh, last year in twenty one, uh, forty five weeks wow. teaching. Forty five weeks seem, didn't seem to be slowing down any. <laughs> no break, <laughs> no break. Yeah, I love what yeah. I do. The travel is tedious, but the people yeah. are phenomenal. And yeah. I don't, you know, like you, Professor. I don't. I don't suffer employment. I've been able to monetize my passion mm-hmm. and it's uh it's a it's a gift. Yeah. So it's a gift. Love what I do. Yeah. And I'm very interested still in what I do and, and, and what other people think about yeah. it and what other honest, good minds uh what their take is on it. So yeah. we want to get you in a car with the Sims guy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. We'll we do. That. We yeah. absolutely want to do, do it. that. I wanna do, do it. Yes, sir. That'll be amazing. Yeah. We we need to to uh, defeat those Russians. <laughs> they have a tournament right now, right? I'm gonna, they, they have a war they tournament. They do. About, yeah, they're doing like tournaments. Fighting in the car, uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. With guns and stuff? No, no just, uh, it's just straight Just jujitsu uh-huh. in the car. Uh-huh. Yeah. Man, you can use the seatbelt and stuff. You can do all that stuff. <laughs> we've, got a, uh, we've got a group of guys in, in Pittsburgh that have been doing this and, uh, with me for a while, and they have... They have a seatbelt choke series. Wow. They have a whole series of seatbelt really? choke. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's fun. All right. And Perfect. they'll do things like, you know, they'll they'll set the belt up and then they'll stomp the seat belt so it locks, you know. And things but like you, uh, you can strike and all that too? Oh, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. And bare, uh, bare hands? Uh-huh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> but that's, a, that's the best way to learn how it to is. fight in the car, it right? Is. You got to put yourself on the situation. It's, it's interesting. The car in particular. Mm-hmm is fascinating as far as what it does to uh, grappling. Yeah. It's completely, yeah. and and if you see it, even as a well-practiced jiu-jitsu guy, uh-huh. you don't really know what you're looking at until you're in the environment. Yeah. And it's fascinating because I've had a lot of jiu-jitsu guys that'll come, uh, very good jiu-jitsu guys, that'll come, they'll get in the car, and they, and they think it's just jiu-jitsu in the car. And here's what's interesting, the environment is so novel and so unusual mm-hmm. it changes the art yeah. and changes pretty significant things like the hierarchy of positions yeah. so now as a jiu-jitsu guy when you look at a flat video mm-hmm. of a guy getting his back taken in a car you're like why why would you know you let your get let your back get taken but because the environment and the way it works yeah. because i can place my feet on the far side door. Yeah, on the ceiling too. Like I can establish a base with my head on the ceiling. I can yeah. put an arm on the dashboard. Mm-hmm. I can grab the headrest. Yeah. I've got all these points of base. 
and I, my power is literally six-fold, and I can yeah. crush you with my back into the B-pillar. Yeah. We tap guys like that. We've, we've actually had people who've had their ribs broken wow. on like a B-pillar pin. So now crazy. we'll get guys who actually will, when we say go, they'll lead with their back. Mm-hmm. I do that quite a bit. Yeah. I'll turn my back, get my feet posted, mm-hmm. and then smash back. So, I mean, it's literally like squatting someone into yeah. a car. I yeah. mean, so it's it works. Because that's one thing that uh, jiu-jitsu teaches us. Like, you use the ground mm-hmm. as your friend. You know, I say that. Absolutely. All the time. For example, like, you put, you put your toes on the mat to mm-hmm. put pressure on your opponent, mm-hmm. right? In the car, like, you're going to step your foot on the door uh-huh. to put pressure on the point or uh-huh. maybe on the ceiling to uh-huh. put pressure on because it increases the 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 weight and the pressure on top of your opponent by by using your feet on the floor so it's different like when you fight with your feet flat mm-hmm. on the floor then like your toes on the mat like putting like some grips and traction on the mat like to push yourself against your point same it thing changes a lot there's yeah. not really a top and a bottom anymore yeah yeah And That's then you what, see that on UFC, for example, uh-huh. like they use the cage right now. It's so hard to to take people down uh, when they're against the cage because yeah. they 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 find skill. Back in the day, no, it was easy, but nowadays it's so hard to take down like a, a striker, for example, because they use the cage as their friend. I would say to protect themselves, and then use that like to defend, right? So uh, also like. In, in the UFC, like back in the day, you used to see like guys picking them up uh-huh. and then bring the guy near the cage uh-huh. and then take them down like near right. the cage. Nowadays, if you do that, they stand up right away because they use the, the cage like to stand up. You know, they don't do that anymore. They prefer to put the fight in the middle uh-huh. right nowadays. Uh-huh. You know, it's different. So the mindset changes when you change the environment. 100%. Right? So if the environment is inside a cube, like a car, you know, Everything you, you change. And It's the different. good thing of jiu-jitsu is the only martial arts where you can adapt to your, your game with the environment. Absolutely. The other martial arts doesn't have that. My But, jiu-jitsu instructor, Mike Sanford, who mm-hmm. is a uh, black belt under uh, the Moraises, mm-hmm. he uh, made an observation after doing my coursework. And I'm a brown belt under Mike. I'm you know old middle-aged brown belt. If I trained more. <laughs> You know, I might be a black belt, but I'm never home. And uh, Mike made a made an interesting observation after doing a couple of courses with me. He did my gun course and my knife course. He said, you know, self defense is just another rule set. Yeah. And I, I thought that was a really interesting observation yeah. as far as the adaptability of a good jujitsu guy. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's just another rule set because I think we'd all agree that jujitsu changes. Uh, you know, a little bit from gee to no gay. It changes a lot more when guys start punching each other in the face. Oh, yeah. And now when we add guns and knives oh. and a cube, yeah. it, it looks like something else, yeah. right? But yeah. the the mindset of a jiu-jitsu guy to adapt the game, that in and of itself, to me, is what makes jiu-jitsu mindset really appropriate for self-defense. Mm-hmm. And... One of the things I want to see are more ju- more curious jujitsu guys um, reclaim mm-hmm. self defense. Yeah, I really want to see that because jujitsu started as a self defense. It did, but when you started as a self defense back the day, uh, we didn't have as much guns like nowadays. You know, <laughs> right? Like people carrying guns like all the time. You know, like a knife or or a stick or something like that, but. I'm talking about like thousands of years, right? When, uh-huh. when the martial arts uh-huh. starts, uh-huh. you know, and the name martial arts, it was it was created for the military, mm-hmm. right? Like the self defense, and then we start like as a human being, we start like oh, let's make tournaments, you know, like putting some rules here. We're not gonna use guns, but like let's just do striking, for example, uh-huh. and then they start creating like karate and all that. Um, But what is interesting about jiu-jitsu, the Brazilian jiu-jitsu, uh, is, is uh, the open mind that the sport has. Even though like there's like some, some people in jiu-jitsu that they have closed mind where they, they say like, oh, old school jiu-jitsu only, you know? Uh, you know, I think like you need to evolve. Like, like you know, when I, when I met you like yesterday, uh, no, Saturday, 
uh, two days ago. Uh, you come to me, you start talking, and then you look at me like, I would like to throw you inside the car <laughs> and see like how you do fighting with someone. I'm like, wow, this guy wants to learn, you know, yeah. because he knows like I can, I have a different perspective Absolutely. of fighting. So I want to see learn. that. So uh, that's what makes you the best in what you do, you know, Thank you, because your love and your passion and, and the mindset that you have, because I, I was, I was talking to you and Brian before, like, uh, I was watching like videos uh, on YouTube, for example, about mm -hmm. self-defense. There's a lot of crap. Most there's of it a, sucks. Yeah, there's a lot of crazy. <laughs> most of it sucks. Yeah, it's right. It's crazy. Like, and and most of those guys, they succeed because the way they talk, they will yeah. hit. They, they look, you. I know. Uh, the they way do. they talk and the way they present themselves, it, it makes them look good. Mm -hmm. You know, but in the real world, it, it's not the way that that works. No, no. You know, I was watching a video of you teaching how to draw a gun in the middle of the crown. Right. Like there's like a lot of things that I was like, man, I never thought about those things. Right. Like, little details, you sure. know. And that's another thing that jujitsu has. It's a lot of details. Uh -huh. It makes a huge difference. It does. Right. A little thing, man. Uh, and uh, just like watching your 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 seminar, like I would say a seminar or a course yeah, yeah. that you taught uh, Saturday and Sunday, I watched like the first hour, and I, I told Brian, like, man, just in one hour here, I learned so much. Uh, and you're just talking. Right. You're just yeah. talking, right? And I was like, man, when you talk about the the distance and the time, how important is the distance right. with time? What that actually yeah. means. Yeah, what actually means, yes. And then you put like yourself very, very near another guy and then where you can reach him, mm -hmm. it's impossible to defend if you take the first action, right? Right. But if you do one step back, that open up the space and increases the time of defense mm -hmm. and it gives you time to defend better. Mm -hmm. You know, so you need to manage the distance as well. Absolutely. Depending on the environment, of course. Absolutely. Right? And one thing great that jujitsu does is like getting close with, with the close distance. You understand, you understand how to manage your distance yes. and how to apply the weight in order to control your, your opponent. Mm -hmm. And in many martial arts, we don't have that. We have the distance of like how to strike. Right. You know, you touch and, and go out, go in and out, mm -hmm. like like uh, boxing or karate and mm -hmm. things like that, which is great to learn. It's important, but we understand like a fight concept after the UFC, the first UFC, right? People didn't understand what Royce Gracie was doing. Like, what the heck? He's hugging the guy. Like, what he's doing? The guy's between his legs and suddenly the guy starts tapping. Everybody, whoa. And what I remember, I, yeah, I started what training this because right? of that. You exactly. Know? I started training because of that. I was like, man, I want to learn that. And the name, Royce Gracie, is not a common name in Brazil. And from Rio de Janeiro, I was like, man, who's this guy from Rio de Janeiro? I never heard about him, you know? And skinny guy, looks yeah. like a volleyball player. I was going to say, yeah. It was killing everyone, all the big giant guys. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the MMA starts, like, evolving. And it's still evolving. It is. It's still evolving. And just like a self-defense. Because back in the day, we watched so much movies, like with Bruce Lee. And I love Bruce Lee, you know, yeah. and all that. Chuck Norris, you know. But the, the, the fighting scenes were very unreal. Very unreal, right? With guns and all that. But yeah. nowadays, if you watch the movies... You see, like in the fight scenes, they do triangles. They do. Even yeah. like in the superhero movies, you see like You'll see triangles, you reverse triangles. Yeah. Like, so in, if you, if you watch like John Wig, uh -huh. right? Like he was a lot of like uh, judo, a yeah. lot of judo throws and I stuff. I think you the know? first jujitsu, yeah. the machados on, helped that. Yeah, the I think the first jujitsu in a major film, if I remember right, that we all were like, "What is that?" I think it was Lethal Weapon. Yeah. They reverse like triangle. We, the reverse triangle. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson like, on Gary Busey, right? Yeah, with, uh, with uh, Riga Machado. Professor exactly. Riga Machado yeah, and yeah, the yeah, races there, there. Early 80s. Yeah, yeah. Or, or 83 or 84, whenever Lethal Weapon came yeah, out. Yeah, but it's like, I remember that scene. What is Riggs doing with his legs? Yeah. What is he doing to that guy? Why yeah. is Gary Busey looking all yeah. purple? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Back then, in, and as you grew up, people thought that this stuff will save my life. This is witchcraft. It's magic. And then it, the 
turned more into the sport. We kept focusing on sport and sport and sport. Guys got really good at the sport. And then their, I think, ego driv- drives them to that closed-minded yeah, yeah. of, of, well, this is what I know. This is what I'm good at. I'm not going to let someone who doesn't train yeah. beat me. And the whole defense side of it went away, which wow. could be a lack of information sharing at the time. You know, that wasn't a big thing. But for me, the biggest reason that we got away from that was uh, there's no testing. Mm-hmm. So if, I, if, if this works, I should be able to put it in any situation, add context to the situation, and it should work. And that's what I got a lot out of your class. Let's add context to everything that we're doing, all of our trainings, put it in context, and then if you think you have something that works, let's see it. Sure. And if it works in that context, yeah. under pressure, we yeah. pressure test it, then we know it's probably going to do all right out yeah. there in the real world. As much as we can know, understanding yeah. that, that all training is a simulation. Yeah. And in yeah. the real world, anything can happen. Slip yeah. on a puddle. The, be- the best athlete can yeah. Yeah, hit a patch of hydraulic fluid in an asphalt parking lot. Yeah. And now somebody that's not nearly as athletically inclined or, or you know, superior to you, they're on top, yeah. mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and you, and you crack your head against a curb, you yeah. know, and you're kind of woozy. And yeah. all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the better athlete just by chance is in a deficit. So, you know, I, I think that's one of the things about self-defense. Here's one of the interesting things about self-defense to me mm-hmm. um, is that, if the ultimate goal for people in self-defense is to not become engaged in any kind of self-defense scenario, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of a conundrum that most of the people who are teaching self-defense are predisposed to fighting. Yeah. And if you really think about it, I mean, who's probably best at avoiding a fight probably the nerdy guy who can't fight yeah yeah so why isn't that guy at least teaching the first part of self-defense mm. you know i mean but yeah, it's always been fight before it, it's the all fight. It, right it's always been an interesting thing negotiation you know yeah negotiation absolutely right yeah, right that's the most important part right the, yeah. the verbal agility component yeah the social literacy component yeah learn how if you bump into somebody yeah you know they're like, what the, what and that's it? wisdom right that's wisdom right because like if you can uh, stop a fight even before the fight happens, yeah, yeah. that that's wisdom, you know. Because uh, I I believe in God, right? I believe in Absolutely. the Word of God, and there's a lot of wisdom there, mm-hmm. you know. And there's a verse that says uh, a rough response causes even more rough response, you know. Like if you if somebody goes angry against you and then you reply with the angriness, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's going to go crazy. Right. Because people think like, oh, I'm right. Mm-hmm. You're wrong. And then, no, you're wrong. I'm yeah. Right. You know, and then you just go like that. And then and then the altercation like start escalating and the violence like comes, you know. And then uh, yeah. I think like this is wisdom when you can negotiate and then just slow down everything. You know, it's the best that we can do, right? And and just and not only negotiating, but I mean, and, and this, you know, I learned this as an undercover officer is, um, you know, deflecting. Because here's a good example. You know, you're in a bar, you know, and uh, you're uh, looking in a certain direction, and a guy looks at you and is like, "Are you looking at my girlfriend?" Yeah. No. Yeah, you are. You're looking right over there. It's my girlfriend. You're looking at my girlfriend. Uh-huh. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. And that and that's not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's not going anywhere, right? Mm-hmm. So how do you deal with that? Okay. Can you lie to support a tactical end state of resolution? Mm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in two years of undercover work, I mean, if I would have never bought drugs, if I didn't lie, I was a professional liar <laughs> for two years. So, I mean, maybe the guy. And you see with the guys face to face. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I maybe. a guy the, like that. Oh, yeah. And maybe the, guy, maybe the guy now looks at me and he says, hey, man. You look at my girlfriend, I was like, man, your girlfriend looks just like my sister who passed away from leukemia like three years ago. Wow. And I just got lost. <laughs> I just got lost in my thoughts, man. I did not mean any disrespect. Wow. And it's just wow. enough to make that guy go, 
Can you buy a drink? <laughs> you have a, a right? So so like the verbal wow. ag- the verbal agility component, yeah. that part of it, yeah. and and the social literacy component, yeah. I think that is an incredibly important part of self defense. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's not letting people get traction on you, understanding how to solve problems that way. Yeah. You know, um, and we we practice that a lot. Mm-hmm. That part of the the soft skills that people pay lip service to, we physically practice and rehearse that. And I'll tell people a lot of times, here's here's something interesting, you know, a really strong fit combat athlete who carries a gun, who is socially awkward and borderline autistic, mm-hmm. and can't read social cues. Mm-hmm. Maybe that guy doesn't need as much math time or as much range time. Range time. Maybe what that guy needs is to go to Toastmasters and learn how to speak in front of a group of people wow. and talk his way out of things. Or maybe he needs to be exposed to a wider variety of people. You know, the the tech nerd that mm-hmm. spends all day in a cube farm mm-hmm. and doesn't have any human interaction. Maybe what that guy needs to do is. You know, go work at a homeless shelter. Mm-hmm. And those scary-looking people on the street corner, are they really scary, you know? Are they yeah. really gonna t- trying to take your life? He needs a little bit more exposure to the world. And especially with people that carry guns, I'm just a huge fan of them expanding their social literacy. Mm. Huge fan of that, if you're going to carry a gun in public space. So that, to me, is as important in self-defense as any kind of physical skill. Amazing. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I love this. Yeah. What about uh is there like any any situation that you you went through? Like uh, like situations like that as a as a uh officer, um, as an undercover cop, mm-hmm. like a situation where somebody's attacking you and you need to use your your skills. Yeah, so I, you know the the and I you know there there's several instances, you know, I, I had a couple of major ones and and a bunch of minor ones. But uh you know one of the main ones was uh the 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 I had a I was buying crack and this was 97, buying crack in a car and uh, a guy robbed me and I'd been robbed a lot up to that point, but there was something about this $40 crack deal and uh there was something about this that felt uh awry and um he actually crossed over and again, there's no car fighting training at the time. You know, I have a little bit of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but it's, you know, minimal. Uh, I'm strong. I'm young. Uh, I've got, got a whole bunch of martial arts, but this guy crossed the center console. I was starting to cross the center console and we had a gun to my head. I grabbed it uh, and, and he followed me over and, wedged me in and that's when the round discharged about an inch away from my head and I was holding the pistol and it, and it malfunctioned but his weight on top of me I was holding the pistol I couldn't get to my gun and not only did um not only could I not access my pistol because this guy had crossed over the center console but I didn't know how to move out of that and manage that weight not only did I not have any grappling uh, that was good enough to defeat that guy who was bigger than me Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't specific to the environment that I was working in. And fortunately, um, that guy finally just got tired of punching me and I wouldn't let go of the gun and he bailed. Um, and we ID'd him cause we used to wire the car for video and audio. So we mm-hmm. had good video on it and we were able to get facial ID. And I think we picked him up in a housing project like 10 hours later. Oh, you know? wow. Um, so, so that was one instance where, okay. Um, not only do I not have the, the tactics and techniques for, for what I'm doing, I'm not even training in the environments mm. that I'm operational in. And, and one of the, I think one of the factors in that's s- when you have this switch, like, Oh, I need to the, learn the, the coming well, to God moment. Yeah. And, and, like and, I, and one of the fact, you know, here's, here's one of the factors that I look at now as a tactics, self-defense or, or motor skills instructor one of the things I look at and I'm always looking at is interesting novel space because motor skills trained in space that's implicitly set up for your comfort and safety. Mm. 
don't look anything like motor skills in the real world, yeah. you know, or environments in the real world. Mm -hmm. Ranges, you know, every range you go to, people are online, they're double arms interval away for safety and comfort, you know, because that's where we're learning skills, but we never take those skills <clears throat> and through however, whatever modality of training, start practicing them in the real world, you know. What does jujitsu look like in, a, in an ascending stairwell? I mean, in a closed ascending stairwell. So we have a mm -hmm. stairwell that's closed, you know. What I, I want to see more and more in jujitsu schools who are interested in self-defense is like novel fight space. Mm -hmm. So if I had a two-floor jujitsu school and I had a closed stairwell, I'm going to mat up everything on that stairwell and we're going to fight going up the stairwell and going down the stairwell. Wow. You know, what does each thing look like? What does that mean? Because mm -hmm. we already mentioned how specific the cage was yeah. and how that changed MMA, yeah. right? The UFC gave us that. Wall work is fairly new, yeah. even though No Holds Barred in Valley Tudo is not. Those mm -hmm. contests were going on a long time ago, right? Yeah. But what made the UFC so unique and specific was the, the vertical plane yeah. of the cage, and it took several years of competition for guys to learn how to exploit that mm -hmm. and then develop very specific tactics and techniques, you mm -hmm. know, as MMA became more integrated. Yeah. What's interesting now is when we see that stuff translated into tactical environments. So, for example, in a, in a CQB or CQC environment where you get four guys in – armor and helmets with nods, you know, and rifles, they come into a room and an, an operator goes down, okay? Well, because there's a gunfight going on and more and more guys, you know, maybe shooting as this person's trying to stand up, maybe now what that commando is doing with a guy on top of him is he's learning how to hip escape and shoulder walk back to the wall and use MMA wall walking techniques with his slung rifle mm -hmm. and work his way up the wall because now we can't have a guy stand up yeah. on the floor in the middle of a gunfight. Yeah. So what we're seeing with you know select branches of the service is they are taking MMA techniques and now adapting them more and more and more to the specificity of their tactical environments. Because right. yeah, if four guys are in a room and everybody's slinging it out and you have a very specific sector, okay, and a guy, boop, goes down, do you really want that guy standing back up, okay? Or should the, the TTP, you know, the best practice be he works his way over, mm -hmm. gets out of everybody's way, and then has to work his way up. So that, that to me is really, you know, that's the next thing going yeah. on is, is, you know, Combat sports inspired contextual specific self defense, yeah. uh, whether it's for you know professional armed populations or the average person, you know fighting in um you know stairwells, fighting in open car doors in and out, you know what does it look like going into the vehicle, going out of the vehicle? So I'm always as a self defense instructor looking for weird space. What is it, what is what does a fight under this desk look like? Yeah. We should pad the bottom of the desk. <laughs> we should have some mat. Uh, we should get in there and see what that feels and looks like. Add yeah. a knife to it. Yeah. You know, how messy does that get? Wow. Does the jujitsu translate the same? Mm -hmm. See, that's what's, that's what's interesting to me. What are the modifications to the art? How does the art have to be modified to make it viable? Yeah. That, and it's interesting. To, to, here's one of the things I've seen is that some environments like vehicles are so specific that you can take someone who's developed a high level of skill and training space and put them in space so specific that what they've learned in training space just doesn't apply. I have had, oh, Scott, with the, the guy that you met, Scott Oates, mm -hmm. the guy that you met uh, that's, uh, you know, helping me out with the course. Scott, he's a third Dan under Solo. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a former Navy SEAL. You know, Scotty's first car fight he got owned not once but twice because the guy he went against was young and athletic, smaller than Scotty, but he had done some car fighting with me previously. Mm -hmm. And he understood the rules of the cube. Mm -hmm. And the environment was so specific 
despite Scotty's vastly superior Brazilian jiu-jitsu, couldn't apply it in that environment. Wow. So that's what's interesting to me, right? Where are the drop-offs in an orthodox martial art or combat sport created in a training environment when we get into super specific novel environments or you do things like add a knife or you do things like add a gun. I think that is what, that's the next thing is to see what good, curious combat sports guys do who have an eye for self-defense, novel space, and understand how it works. And that's what I'm trying to do is get guys like you to claim self-defense wow. that's what i want to see yeah Man, i think most of incredible. these things that happen at least the ones i've experienced where we've gotten into to fights at work or something they always have some sort of cluttered disorganized component to them like we had one uh dan and i had to to fight a guy in a 7-eleven and he ended up going through the donut stand but every one of them it always seems you're in a, a cluttered uh disorganized apartment or a small confined space and it really changes how we uh how we have to react within those environments but i think something i'd love to hear from the both of you i i know how i feel in these situations you've competed in front of thousands of people and the the feelings you get from that and you you're all of your experience now when you go to a you go somewhere you're in a situation where there there could be something bad happen the the late night parking garage i like to use the the late night gas station because that's what i see every day absolutely um when i go to a call there's a 250 pound guy screaming no shirt on in the middle of the street with all my experience and training i don't want to say it's not that i'm nervous or afraid maybe concerned i still feel like I know, I know how this could go wrong mm-hmm. for me or for that guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, how do you guys manage this when you go in, you know, fighting in front of a yeah. couple thousand people or all of your experience? How do you manage the, uh, the I'm, I'm about to get into something right yeah. now and not, I'm, I might twist my ankle when I yeah. walk in. And right. it still gives me pause yeah. even to this day. I think a lot of people see someone with a lot of experience and they think, oh, they're, yeah. they're not afraid when they walk into that. That's, but I, yeah, I don't, that's, I don't have that with me. Yeah, I right. feel it when for, I'm going for anywhere. Me, for me, Brian, I think, uh, the training, the training is what gives you the confidence, right? Right. Like I, I, I fight jujitsu, uh, for 26 years, right? Competition, maybe like 24 years competing and all that. Uh, I still have adrenaline. You still like you're gonna have adrenaline, and a lot of people will be like, uh, ask me like, "Oh, how do you control your adrenaline? Like, how to to control like your anxiety?" You right. know, and the training will prepare you for those situations, right? That's why I was mentioned with you like before. I said, Professor, like a lot of times, like I see like cops, they do like a one day course or two day course every two three years, you know. And then, like, when they're in those situations, they feel like they're not prepared physically, uh, technically, or even with the strategy. And how are you going to defeat? You know, how are you going to defeat the, the opponent? You know, how are you going to deal with the situation? It's like, uh, for example, I have a super fight coming up, a big fight, and I just decide to, like, not train and, and eat whatever I want. And, you know, and then the fight day comes, you know. And the difference of a fight you know, this is a huge. That's a, a huge difference between being a cop and being an athlete. Sure. When you're an athlete, you know the day you're gonna fight. You know, like you you can train your mind to that day. You know, and but every day you gotta put into that situation. You know, for that specifically day. But when you're a cop, like any any time that can happen. You're here right now. Something can happen, right? Like. I, you know, even like we as an athlete, we should think like, oh, I'm walk on the street, like something can happen, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Right? But uh, we don't have that mindset uh, until something happened in our life, right? But when you're a cop, you always like aware, you know. And his father was a cop here, okay. the guy here behind the camera. <laughs> his father was a cop, yeah. And he he told me one day like, oh, my father was always like walking like this. He was like always right. like aware you know and i think like the best thing you can do because you're gonna feel adrenaline you're gonna feel adrenaline 
competing a lot for me, like as an athlete. More you compete, more you can control the adrenaline, yeah. right? Uh, and as a cop, like more you get into those situations, more experience you're gonna have, more you're gonna know how to control your adrenaline, your 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 anxiety, for example, right? You don't know, you don't know what's gonna happen. But when you're very well trained, you have more confidence. Yeah. And because you have the confidence, you control better the situation and yourself, you know? For me, it's that, you know? I don't know if I'm wrong, but that's how that's how I feel, you know? And, and I think it's key to study, train, and have your life uh, from what you do, like if you're a cop, if you're a fighter, fighter, or whatever you are, uh, you must uh, train every day and have that as a lifestyle. Right. You know, just an athlete have a lifestyle of being an athlete. You gotta have the lifestyle. If you don't have the lifestyle, you're gonna be steps behind. You know, you gotta be steps ahead. Right. Of the situation, right? Absolutely. And and um, I remember like one day, for example, like we we did a self defense class here. And I have one of my black belts, world champion, Dominique Bell. He got a gun. He put a gun behind him. And he looked at me. He did this. I'll fight Brian, you know. And then he jumped on Brian. And he started wrestling with Brian. And then while he was trying to pull his gun out, Brian was underneath of him stabbing his nuts. Right. <laughs> with like a plastic knife. Right. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, what's right. happening? Exactly. You know? And then like he wasn't prepared for that. Right. You know, and then he realized like, man, having a gun is not enough. Right. You know. Being a black belt of jiu-jitsu is not enough. I need to train to be in those situations. So I believe like when you when you put yourself in scenarios like that, even like having fun, right? Because the training uh -huh. is the fun part. Uh -huh. But when it goes the, the the real the real life story, like everything changes, right? right? When the situation happens, you just like but I think is that like once you're prepared, once you're well trained, you're gonna control yourself better. And that's yeah. why we train, uh, right? hundred percent. Yeah. I, I would agree with that at every bit of what you said and it kind of like what we were talking about with with specific environments you know, a friend of mine John Hearn a very very literate trainer made a remark here not long ago that one of the main things we have to do to prepare people for self-defense situations is in training remove novelty so here's <clears throat> here's the thing you know what creates um, panic or ramps you up generally is uncertainty. So one of the things that I want to do as a trainer is make sure that you as a police officer, I'm exposing. So when we do a scenario and you, you know, in one case walk up and I, and I like to, you know how I like to teach Brian, I like to um, send a guy through a scenario and then have him stand aside and watch the next guy that runs through the scenario. So everybody gets, perspective first and third person so maybe now if i were doing police training you know we run that scenario of that screaming guy in the parking lot and in one case you know police officer approaches him and uh he guys big and scary looking and um then you know the guy immediately when he's touched just starts crying and that kind of thing so it doesn't go physical mm -hmm. right in the next scenario so that we pull that guy a guy out and he watches the next guy for go through the next scenario, uh, he he um, walks up and approaches the guy, and the guy starts crying, and then he runs. So it turns into a foot pursuit. And then, all right, where's that going to go? And in the next scenario, um, he walks up to the guy. The guy starts crying, and um, then he punches the police officer, you know. And then after he punches the police officer, he says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. You know, and he lays on the ground and allows himself to be cuffed. In the next scenario, right, we he punches the police officer and tries to grab his gun. And in the next scenario, you know, uh, we do the same exact thing. He punches the police officer, tries to get his gun. We allow the police officer to start to get control again. And then somebody else walks up and says, that's my brother, and hits the police officer with a two-by-four, a padded one. So wow. constantly injecting variability and novelty and, and having people not only experience that, but observe that, that's a huge, and, and what that does for you is gets you thinking, all right, and, and training should always make you say, if it's good training, it should always make you say, wow, I've never seen that before, 
wow, I've never thought of that before. Yeah. So now when you are on duty and you aren't approaching that guy in the parking lot, all that stuff is running through your mind. You're calm. You know why? Because you've been there before. So exposure and removing novelty, I think, are really key elements of effective training that help reduce your uncertainty and help you manage your anxiety because you have exposure, you have competence, and competence is what creates confidence. Mm. This is good. Uh, (laughs) Competence creates confidence. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. If you know, you know what, this scenario here, just like this the other day, and uh, when I was walking up, you know, I started getting shot at, you know, from uh, an oblique angle, and a hide, you know, from a, a whatever, you know, in the scenario. You're thinking about that when you're approaching that guy. You're not, you know, it's it's in your mind. You know what? This could be a bait, mm-hmm. you know, into a gunfight. I don't know. This could be what it is. It's just be a crazy guy screaming. Yeah. This guy may fight. This guy may run. This guy may start bawling and crying. I don't yeah. know. But but I think that I think exposure and removing novelty. That's how that's how we prepare you. That's how we inoculate you. I, yeah. I definitely have uh, every now and then I'll, I'll train and you're doing fine, but you get into kind of a, maybe a rut, I would say. And I, I told Asa one time, I feel like a lot of these situations are luck. I go into the room and I take the guy down. I control him. It's all easy. It happens all the time. And I'm like, it's just luck. If the guy was hiding in the narrow corner, when I go in the room and hits me in the head with a pipe, I'm done. And, uh, and he had a, I don't know if it was his saying, but he's like, all the situations are luck, but the training you do improves your luck. Mm. I always thought that was a, what a good way of of putting it. You know, I am improving my luck. I'm improving my chance through it by, by the training. And, uh, I just wish we could encourage more people to do that. That's my, been my sole goal at at least at my department trying to get as many cops out there i know we focus a lot on the the officer side of it because that's what i do but Mm -hmm. it's valuable for everyone i I think that old expression you know fortune favors the bold i think we could also say luck favors the prepared because here's the thing Mm. generally here's an interesting yeah here's an interesting dichotomy the the people who actually have a lifestyle of training rarely have to use it mm. yeah. yeah yeah that's true the the things we hear about mm-hmm. the scenarios we hear about the case studies are always people who didn't have training mm. who needed training yeah whose training was faulty yeah. good training for whatever reason you know i mean it's like you know vaccination for bad you know yeah. <laughs> for bad yeah. outcomes yeah. Uh-huh. you know that's what i think and I, i'm not sure why that is but rarely do we see people who are training enthusiasts and have a lifestyle of training rarely do we see them involved in scenarios where they are fighting for their life or even yeah. fighting for whatever reason you know that's yeah. that's interesting to me and well, I'm I know sure why Scott that works. and I talked about that yesterday. All the all of these skills that we've acquired, it's a, uh, it's the way you carry yourself, the way you speak to the people out there. Mm-hmm. I don't have as many use of forces as some of the other guys I know, mm-hmm. and maybe it's because uh, when I'm speaking to the guy, I can feel him out immediately. I know I can. The guy's angry. I can let him run his mouth a little yeah. bit, and a lot of times, because some have, people just need to yell. Because you that's have the con- end of it. Because you're you're yeah. competent. And you have confidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not worried about this guy sucker punching you. You're not worried. It's like, All right, that may happen. Yeah. Again, that's why you've got competence and confidence. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just learning here. <laughs> yeah. It, it's so important, like to to be prepared, you know, and just like Brian say in the in the beginning, he is the He's the one that go out there and then use everything that he's learning, right. you know, in those uh, scenarios, mm-hmm. right? Um, and with the open mind, you see like what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. And I believe like from what I see, with all that you being study 
you know, for the past like 20 years, right? Or more. Um, you already pretty much have so much like scenarios uh, in your mind that you're like, oh, this is right and this is wrong, mm -hmm. right? Just the fact of saying like, oh, the communication, you know, and understanding what is communication. Yeah. And we got to learn a little bit about uh, psychology as well, right? Like what can happen inside someone's mind by the way they say, they're speaking, or the body language, right? So you can kind of like predict what's coming, mm -hmm. right? And that's really important. And knowing ourselves, like knowing more about yourself, because um, I think like this is key for, for an athlete, right. you know? and for a cop as well that that will increase your ability of understanding people and but first of all and most important is knowing yourself yeah. right and <clears throat> i say that to to a lot of people like i never done that before but i i started doing therapy for example mm -hmm. you know with a psychologist and i started learning more about myself than Absolutely. ever you know and a lot of people they they don't don't like to do it because they don't want to open up their heart to other people and things like that, you know, yeah. but, uh, just like you say, like there's some people that they're like awkwardly uh, in a way of talking with people that can affect them in a way of like reacting to situations, mm -hmm. you know, uh, or acting, you know, in the situation. So <clears throat> I believe like learning more and more about us, about ourselves, would definitely like help I'm, you know and absolutely it, right and 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 when i start doing doing uh uh, uh th the therapy for example mm -hmm. uh, it was incredible i was like man i wish i could have done that before yeah. you know and before i was just reading you know and i like to to read like uh uh books that help me mm -hmm. you know in my lifestyle and all that but when you start like understanding that the type of personalities that exists in this world you yeah. know just according to the way that the person is you know you just like can kind of like put yourself in 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 that situation yeah. or in the shoes of the person on their heart and kind of like predict like what can come absolutely you know? so i think like that's another thing that uh everyone should be aware you know and learn you know i, I never been like in a war scene i never been a in a, a cop scene, you know, but I've been into fights before, you yeah. know, and uh, there's a lot of ways for you to react. Now I'm an adult, you know, and the the rules in the, on the street is knowing the law, I right. think, right? Like, you got to know the law, right? It definitely because, helps. Right? Yeah, you, yeah, you got to know because you can, you can, um, you can uh, do things that, of course, it may protect you, but you can also like lose your life in a way of like go to jail and yeah, you know, and all that. So you gotta yeah. know like the right thing to do at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I think like studying is important as well, right? Knowing like the civil laws that you have, like when I can start like protecting myself or when I can do this and when I can do that. Right. Of course, it's a life and death situation, sure, right? But um. It, to to have that all in your mind it's it's hard like in the middle of like uh, a chaos right right it's it's very hard but uh i think like watching and and learning from you here like watching your videos and learning like uh, in this conversation here that's what is passing my mind you know yeah. for from my my experiences you know that i have as an athlete uh, as a person you know as a human being right right so, yeah, and, and I think also, you know, on, on that note about knowing laws, just understanding that, man, there are a lot of people in this world that are just not like you. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, you know, we see, you know, people who uh, will will take a life because of a, you know, nothing, a, a bad look. Yeah, look at me disrespectfully. Yeah, you know, as a you know well adjusted, Crazy. psychologically, emotionally healthy person who's successful you're like what mm -hmm. that's enough yeah yeah that's it's enough crazy. yeah it's you crazy know? i mean i didn't think somebody'd be willing to blow my brains out over 40 dollars worth of crack <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's true that that quick 
Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Uh, so uh, I think that kind of thing right there, just understanding that uh, knowing really what this is, you know, is this something mm-hmm. I can talk my way out of? Is it something that, okay, that's, it's on. That, yeah. That's, the, that's yeah. the other thing I see too is yeah. a lot of people who are not exposed to criminality, you know, or even street culture. They just don't know when it's go time. A, yeah. a friend of mine that's passed away used to say most people don't, um, they, they don't hit the gas hard enough and early enough because they just, yeah. they're caught in the cycle of disbelief, well-intentioned, good people. Mm-hmm. So, and, and if you think about a person that, you know, wasn't raised in an abusive household, they, yeah. they were middle class, you know, maybe they were discouraged in school from any kind of, you know, fighting yeah. because, you know, all the schools have been zero tolerance since Columbine. Yeah. So little boys don't know how to like rough house and yeah. resolve things physically. Yeah. So when they are confronted with something like that, you know, their reaction to it is either disbelief or maybe um, overreaction in a lot of cases. You know, that's what we see with a lot of police officers. That's what I see with a lot of young police officers who, you know, you got a cop who's 24 years old, you know, uh, with a badge and a gun, and he's never been punched in the face. Yeah. And now we're, we have an expectation for that young man or that young lady with a gun and a badge yeah. that they can can navigate the world in a nuanced yeah. legal way yeah. and do the right thing that's a lot without training with yeah with <laughs> or, or with Imagine. bad or with bad training yeah right yeah. With poor training. yeah that's what i mean yeah yeah with i mean poor that's because yeah. most tra- be rough. Mo- most most training honestly that police officers undergo is designed to cover the agency mm-hmm. not improve the survivability of the officer yeah. It's designed to tick a box. It's in the mm-hmm. agency's best interest, not the individual officers. Yeah, that's a reality. That's an unfortunate yeah. reality. Because, like, uh, as an athlete, for example, like when I start uh, fighting, uh, I always had the mindset of, of course, like to win the battle, you know, to overcome my opponent. Absolutely. Uh, but your mindset must be like a black belt mindset, I would right. say, right? Like. You are already a black belt, even though like your mind, your heart is a black belt, even though you're a white belt or a blue belt or right. a purple belt. And when you are in this situation, for example, this cop, 24 years old, never get punched in the face, have the gun and all that. He can fight against a guy that had like a completely different experience than right. him, like a black belt. Right. A guy that got punched in the face many times, a guy that like. And all black, that knows how to manage a gun and knife and all that. It's a black belt in life. Exactly. Yeah. Black belt in life. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's what I mean. So you got to you gotta, uh, fight your, your way or train your way to be a black belt in life. Yeah. You know? And, and of course, life is about experience. Right? Absolutely. Life's about experience. And at 24 years old, it's very young. We know that. But then, like, he needs to put hours and hours and hours of training to make him pass through, like, situations and experiences that will turn him into a black belt mm-hmm. in life, right? In a short period of time. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's, it's incredibly challenging. Yeah. It's One of the things I, I, the reoccurring things I see, cops, not cops, doesn't matter. A person with limited or poor training and a lack of confidence I always see them using a lot of force too late. So if they had started off their their choice to use force against someone for whatever the reason, the situation called for it, if they started that earlier, they could have used a lot less than what they needed to do. Yeah. And I see it in, in my law enforcement world, and then you see it as the, uh, when I'm interacting with victims of crimes. If they had started what they were gonna do down here, they wouldn't have had to use so much down here. Yeah. And it's a, it's a real reoccurring trend that I've, I've seen. I mean, it could just be my own subjective observation, but that's what I see. And then with the training component, I, I don't, I think I have said it to you before. Most departments, they weigh how much is it going to cost if this officer dies? It's going to cost X number of dollars. Now it's going to cost us this many dollars to adequately train the entire department mm. to prevent that one death. 
as mm-hmm. long as this value outweighs the value of that one officer's life, you will never resolve this problem. Yeah. So it's up to the, the individual. If I care about yeah. myself, yeah. more so if I care about the people I'm supposed to be serving and the people I work with left and right, I will seek it out on my own. And gotcha. the law side of it, it's really difficult. I very rarely see it in any course that I've been to outside of yours and uh, PFC out right. in Las Vegas. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had probably one of the best use of force decision trees that I've I've ever seen and the reasoning behind the force. They, right. they talked about the follow on actions. It is it's really difficult to know. Am I in a situation that I can use force? Yeah. And and uh, one of the big things you always point out, we the law doesn't require you to get hit before you start acting on someone. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard thing to teach. And another part of that, which most people don't ever teach, is the follow-on actions. I just got into a situation, what's the next step? Mm. How do I I explain to the jury that I I acted in fear? Not fear for myself, but I feared the consequences of Mm -hmm. me not acting. If I didn't do what I did, there was gonna be some negative outcome that could have resulted in X. So I needed to do what I did. And you rarely see that in any course. Yeah. Wow. The exploration of ambiguity, that's a big one. That, that's what most people can't navigate. If it's black or white, you know, they still might be indecisive. But when you add the other 98 shades of gray, now all of a sudden that's a that's a lot that i'm looking at should i should i not Mm -hmm. so to your point about most people not acting early enough it's because they don't know what they're looking at due to the lack of exposure and they are indecisive how do you develop someone who is decisive they must have variability and exposure right so now they know what they're looking at or even if they don't it you know, maybe thematic, familiar vein. thematically, right. It's pretty close to that. Now that person's making quicker decisions and they, they don't have to compensate with way more force because they're trying to make that up, right? Because they're trying to come out of the hole. So that that's a big one right there, I think is, is, you know, exploring ambiguity. That's why, you know, a lot of the scenarios, when we do like the 2v1 on Sunday, I tell people, I said, look, this this scenario may end up without a gun being drawn or a shot being fired. This scenario may end up with you on the ground getting your ass whipped by two dudes and shot with your own pistol. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. just exposing people to that, yeah. right? So It's like you really don't know what's going to happen. You just have to navigate this yeah. with, with a... a the right tools and that's what we we teach people how to do so it's up to the person or officer to invest on his on his training 100 percent. i agree always need to do it themselves if we were to paint the the black and white example because this is we get a lot of new officers we're trying to to train them and ace is really big on this i know you're going to be able to handle the black and white answer not uh a guy is in front of you and he points a gun right at you. He says, I'm going to shoot you. It's you're either going to shoot him first or you're going to die. It's One simple. Mm-hmm. But now we have you're uh, you're at the gas station in the middle of the night. You know that there's been a lot of increasing violent crime in that area. And mm-hmm. a guy is standing in front of you. He's disheveled and he has his hands inside of his sweater and he's screaming and he's walking to you. Now what do you do? Mm. It could be that his next movement is he pulls a gun out and shoot you. It or could he has be, nothing. yeah, or he has nothing. He pulls it out and it's a piece of lint and he's oh. obsessed. Or, with or he's, hold, of lint. he's holding his colostomy bag. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen this. Actually. I have to. Yeah. I was going to say, we've <laughs> I've seen, seen this, right? <laughs> so that just every, wow. we've all seen that guy, right? Who's crazy? Used to be in the game, you know. Yeah, and he got shot. He's got a bag. He's an addict. Usually He's just they shot off themselves. anymore. Usually they shot, yeah, may have shot themselves. We've all seen wow. that guy, right? Yep. That's that's a common story, you know, is to see whoever, right? That we all know him, right? We all knew him back in the day. Then he kind of went crazy. Now he's got that bag. Now he's wandering around. He's homeless and crazy. 
you know, but he, he could be dangerous and he definitely used to be dangerous, you know, that, right? I mean, how many regular people get exposed to that? That's one of the things that I will say about law enforcement, right? They're um, generally not fit. They generally don't shoot that well, but they get exposed to a wide variety of human beings yeah. and a wide variety of strata, yeah. which regular people just normally in the course of their lives, which are fairly fixed, really don't, Yeah, you know? And it's never uh, anyone's best day, you know? Everyone we speak to, it's the worst day of it's their the life. It's the worst day of their wow. life. That's As crazy. a police officer, everybody's a victim or a suspect yeah. for the most part. In terms of percentage, like how, how many officers like invest in, in their training? 17.36. <laughs> That's pretty specific. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I like, like making up percentages. It, it's a, very I, like, very I'd, little. Right? I'd, say, I'd say less than 10%. No way. Yeah. Really, I'd say less than ten percent. So the 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 other like let's say 90 percent. I would say out of a hundred officers, ten might try jujitsu. They train it. They baby. try jujitsu. They try, and out of those, not out, like training every day. Try jujitsu. Jeez, I'd say ten out of a hundred by choice. Yeah, will try jujitsu, and of those ten, wow, I'd say three or four will make it to a blue belt and stay in. And and I'll say something here that probably like can can make some officers like mad. <laughs> it's like if you don't train, if you don't do that, you're very irresponsible. Irresponsible. I think so. You know? I think so. Like you're not responsible enough like to to your life, to yourself, you know, and to those around you or to the community. Right? So Yeah, and how many personally responsible people do we know whether they do or don't wear badges you know i, yeah. I don't think police oh, officers, yeah. i don't think police officers are yeah. any more personally responsible than anybody else and i'll say there are even some who are less personally responsible yeah. and yeah. um have an expectation that uh you know the agency is going to do this and the agency is going to do yeah. that the agency should yeah. do this i used to tell young guys when i'd hear them complain about what the agency doesn't do. Hey, look, man, it's not the agency's fight. Yeah. It's your fight. If you want to be prepared for your fight, you'll take your time, you'll take your money, yeah. and you'll do what you need to do to prepare yourself for your fight. And most so, most like this is this happens because of their ego, right? I don't even know if it's your, I, I, you know, I, I don't know, Andre. I don't think I don't even know it's if it's ego so much as it is or laziness, amb amb ambivalence, right? Wow, ambivalence. Yeah. I mean, but there's a lot of ego. There's, there yeah. is, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of ego. There's a lot of ambivalence. There are a lot of people just to, you know, Cause, uh, like sometimes I heard, I heard like, I talk with other people that tr train like officers before and they say like, Oh, you know, sometimes the officer doesn't like to go to jiu-jitsu facility and get tapped out by civ civ civilians. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time. Or sometimes like, Oh, the officer doesn't train because sometimes he can show up at the gym and the guy that he just like. Uh, put a handcuff last night is into training right you know sometimes that can happen right, <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> but yeah. uh i don't think like uh it will be smart enough to to train only with officers you know officers with officers that, that helps that's very important but also i think like officers should train with civilians as well 100 percent. you know to understand their mind their mindset yeah. to understand like the behavior, or even like training the competitors, you know, and like Brian, for example, he's a black belt here, and he did all my ADCC training camps. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, all the ADCC training camps, Brian was here, helped me out, and and usually like during ADCC training camps, he got so fit because he does the whole process too, kind of like he prepared himself for absolutely a, a huge like tournament, and he yeah. he's trained every day with like world class grapplers. Uh -huh. Yeah, it used know? to be like. Six of us. Yeah. yeah now there's money in it. So now everyone's yeah, coming, right? Yeah. But it used to be like five, six Crazy. people. Yeah. You, Hoffa. Yeah. Man. Exactly. There's like barely anyone there. Yeah. But that was the best. It Brian, was like, like, it was like private training from yeah. the yeah. world's best, right? Yeah. It was. Yeah. Amazing. You know, like, and, and, and you probably feel like so prepared. Like, of course, you have like the adrenaline and everything. But sometimes, like, you just like take the guy down, control him, handcuff, no problem. 
you know other than like uh you know uh, i don't and then you see those like footage of like a cop that doesn't know how to handle like two cops can't handle one person the like, guy that doing was, the cartwheel as he runs away yeah <laughs> right it's embarrassing yeah. exactly oh that, yeah. that, or or you know like the uh there, there was a lot of criticism of the um uh, the shooting in the um i think it was a wendy's parking lot in uh, yeah Atlanta. yes mm-hmm. that that you know Two police officers couldn't. We, couldn't uh, we that talked guy. about it. The yeah. guy was drunk inside of the the <laughs> drive yeah, yeah, yeah. in Georgia. Right? Yeah, Georgia. I saw that man. Crazy. Lack of physical skill. Yeah. You know, maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah. I hate to Monday morning quarterback anyone, and but maybe uh, more physical skill would have kept that guy from being shot. Yeah, and you can tell too, like, uh, by the communication, mm-hmm. you can tell like the cop is not prepared as well. The way he, he commands stuff and Here's talks. Voice. Yeah, the voice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah, no. Get out the car, voice man. Voice oh, Yeah. You, you know? hear the panic. Yeah, yeah. You can hear the panic. Yeah. Ugh, yeah. And, and and uh the the bad guy, he feels that. You know, like, this guy's not prepared. He knows exactly he knows. what's going yeah, on. Yeah, exactly. So he was more prepared than the cop, yeah. you know, in the, the situation. People engaged in that life. Crazy. They are. They are mentally set. They and know they, if if you're faking it or not faking yeah, it. They know if you're scared. Yeah. Not scared. Yeah. They immediately. Especially they if the guy is very like he was. He's willing to kill you hundred percent. Oh yeah. He just don't don't care, and he feels right away because he act like really cold, right in the scenario, and then shoots you. I um, get a, a lot of cops you know, will don't respect at all. Yeah. A lot of cops they'll Crazy. they'll say I'm never gonna go inverted. I'm not, you know, I'm never gonna uh, do like a flying arm bar. Why why should I train this this yeah. sort of stuff? And yeah. I still find a tremendous value out of comp like competition and and sports yeah. training. Yeah. You get like the the physical part, the the mental part of decision making under bad decisions. Yeah. I still encourage all of them to yeah. to go and do it and add the the scenario based stuff to mm-hmm. it and now when i train when i'm here i don't do all the stuff i used to do because i'm more focused on what can i use in here that works in what the kind sport? of guard i'll play yeah but it also works in the real world yeah. and that's what i'm focused on yeah. i think if a, a lot of people did that we wouldn't see situations like that yeah. and i know a lot of a lot of cops get pissed off when you say you probably shouldn't have done that. You probably should have prepared a yeah. little bit better before this situation happened. Yeah. But that's the the reality of it. We got to get rid of the ego and just accept. Yeah. Are you really getting into a fight or are you showing up and a guy who doesn't want to fight you, he wants to run away, is trying to run away and the two of you are flopping over each other on the ground, right. both getting exhausted. Neither of you know how to, how to control yourself physically and that's the reality of the mm-hmm. situation. That's what it mostly is yeah. for the, usually what we're seeing on TV in mm-hmm. these incidents. It's people yeah. who can't physically control themselves right. or the other person. Right. Yeah. Uh, but professor, like, um, of course I'm a white belt on these, you know, like, um, I'm a white belt. You're you a know? black belt in life. No, I'm Andre. black belt in jiu-jitsu. You're a black belt you know? in life <laughs> but too. In all this, all this scenario, all this, uh, gun, closed gun fight and all that, you mm-hmm. know, uh, sometimes I, I do things with Brian, we we have fun and we learn. Killed stuff. me a lot last yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like our our school, for example, Atos, right? We we do jujitsu with the gi and we do jujitsu no gi. Mm-hmm. Brian does both, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then sometimes the cop, like the officer, uh, would ask. It can be like a firefighter too, right? Because I yeah. I, I have a, a firefighter captain Mo, and he. Uh, he being he he's been, he has been like through situations where like a guy like pass out and then like he's like rescuing Wait, the guy and the yeah, guy wake up like up fighting yeah. fighting that happens all the time yep. so even if you're a firefighter you got to be prepared for those yep. type of scenarios and then he was like man professor I'm like I'm 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 a brown belt back in the day he was a brown belt he's like, I'm a brown belt and 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 uh, I felt like man in that situation like how I gonna handle this guy you know and then he of course like, he took the guy down control but he felt like unprepared you know he felt right. unprepared even with all the training and that you know so um my goal because right here we train with the gi no gi and we i believe we are the only school that have great results on both, both. right right 
gie no gi. Uh, because usually the schools they're like either like really good no gi or really good gi. One of the two. Yeah, but here we we merge like we can do both really well. In my career too, like I have I have titles, world titles in both. Right. Right. So uh but right now, uh considering all that's happening and I, I put that in my in my in my mindset, you know, inside my my heart, uh on merging the jujitsu uh scene with guns. Yeah. You know, that's why I I'm bringing you here. Absolutely. I wanna have you more times here with us. Yeah. And we can kinda like merge uh those scenarios you know and prepare people uh, civilians and officers like to become their best you know those situations yeah. just by communicating how to communicate how to the distance you know like and all that so right all the things all the tools that's important to prepare you for those situations you know and especially with all that's happened in the world uh people are very like i would say impatient like they're more nervous or they don't know what's about to come or they're losing their jobs and all that. And then you have more like people getting into fights and it's not like getting that. any safer. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. not getting any safer. No, there's, a, yeah. there's a spike right in, in personal violent crime it's crazy around right? the country. Right. It's a huge spike. Yeah. In all our metropolitan, areas. even against officers and all that. Right? Uh, everyone. everyone. That's crazy. Everyone. They're the, the crime around yeah. the country yeah. compared to five years ago. Yeah. It's, tripled so a lot of beer i want to implement more of this training here you know absolutely and and i know like for brian for example like he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu he trains jiu-jitsu he has his his work right he works all all day and then he comes and train at night mm -hmm. um but um you know like uh, we are we are looking for like having someone to give us like instruction yeah. you know and sometimes i do like free seminars, even free seminars with Brian. Brian teach things that he learned from you and all mm -hmm. that. And even mention your name all the time, you right. know. I learned this from Craig right. and all that. And uh, we want to open people's mind, you know, and make them understand that uh, physically you gotta be prepared, right? Mentally you gotta be prepared. Uh, psychology you gotta be prepared, of course. Uh, and uh, without knowing the martial art of jiu-jitsu, it's gonna be hard and yeah. tough, right? So I I want to put that in our system, right. you know? I want to put that in our in our academy. Absolutely. Because um, I feel that will increase the confidence of those who train jiu-jitsu because it's it's completely different. When you when you put like life in that situation, it's not sure. like win and lose. Right. Like win and lose, you go in a tournament, you win, you lose. Of course, when you lose, you get sad. But on the street, if you lose, you can lose your life. Yeah. Or you can carry something for the rest of your life, like oh. a, like a problem. You know. Like Both a, people lose. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You know. <laughs> I mean, if 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 I've stabbed Brian four times in his neck and he manages to shoot me, who wins? Yeah. It's crazy. right? Everybody loses. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing too. Man, that's crazy. Man. So I want to like. Yeah. We we're gonna be talking more. You know. We are gonna and be talking. I, more. I I I'm very open minded to 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 have you here more and more and put our training systems you know in our facility i think that will help us a lot tremendously absolutely and i know like you have affiliates uh in the country right you have, yeah like, you are one now <laughs> <laughs> well, it's you are one now so <laughs> I, I, and, and I, we were having this discussion it's been a few yeah. years since i've been in southern california um teaching regularly and between you know, uh, the goodwill, you know, that you've shown me and, and Shiv works this weekend and, and the immediately good feel. I'm an old dope cop, so I, I follow my gut. You know, I have an expression uh -huh. that life's a dope deal. Uh -huh. You know, if it feels good, I'll do it. And if it doesn't feel good, I just walk off. Yeah. But I immediately felt good when we met. I was like, man, I like that guy a Thank lot. You. So that, that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing is uh, between, you know, what we've got going with uh, our guys with San Diego Police Department and what we've got going on with uh with uh the navy yeah you know uh i don't know man i think san diego is the new shiftworks uh socal hub you know and mm -hmm. uh, i love the area yeah i like san diego way better than you say like you're gonna move here soon? i don't know man i might get a <laughs> might maybe get a place out here man but uh we definitely want to do 
um, a lot more stuff with you, Professor. And okay. uh, we we want to definitely you know partner with uh, autos, and we want and, and I want. And I've always said that if this is going to be a legitimate field of study, it's going to have to expand beyond me. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm not interested yeah. in uh, being Sensei Crease. You yeah. know, yeah. what I am interested in is turning this, you know, combat sports, you know, driven self defense contextual with weapons and novel environments with smart people who are competitors. You know, that's that's still that's emerging. Yeah. That's all of that this is new. Yeah. And and the brighter, more capable minds that we get involved with this now. Yeah. I wanna see what a world class jujitsu guy looks like fighting in a car with a gun. Yeah. I wanna see what that looks like. I wanna see what he figures out after his experience. Yeah. That's what's interesting to me and that's what's exciting. And even after twenty years of doing this and being yeah. really the first guy that started doing this, mm-hmm. I, I'm still like, wow. What don't I know? All right. You know, we'll and it. where's it going to go next? Yeah. So we're going to come back. All right. Yeah. We're going to defeat those Russians. We are. I, <laughs> I, and if I can build it up, you know, with guys and, you know, Atos and Shivworks co branded. Let's do it. Red, white, and blue rash guards. Yeah. We'll build it up like Rocky versus Drago. <laughs> you know, and we'll go over there Let's do it. and we'll win. Where is the tournament? In Moscow? I don't know where it's at, man. I've got the guy's, uh, I've got his uh, contact information. Oh, really? Yeah, a friend of mine or ran, have, ran him down and uh, I've, yeah. I've got his contact information. I have, I have a huge uh, following on, on Russia. Do you really? A lot of Russians like, follow me. I think, they love uh, me there. I think we need I to, uh, we might need to go over there. Yeah, yeah. You might, for you sure. might need to do a car fight. I fought there one time. Did you really? Yeah, I did. We could do a, we could do an Atos uh, car fighting camp. All right. And we'll go over there and I think we'd win. Nah. <laughs> I, actually, I know we You're would. You're the best. Because I can look at, I can see what they're doing. I'm like, nah, they're not, uh, they haven't figured out how to do that right yet. <laughs> All right. They haven't. Great, great. <laughs> Professor, thank you so much. Professor, for being thank here, you. Right, uh, it was an honor for me to have you in my gym, my As facility. Well. You're very welcome here anytime. Okay, thank you, Brian. Thank you one more time. Right, you're you're the best. It's a okay? meeting of the minds. Anything yeah, you together. you you need from me, I'm here for you. Okay, and you yeah. too. Okay, Professor. Thank you, boss. All right, I appreciate you. All right, guys, this is one more podcast. God bless all. Uh, Professor, you want to give your information like for people who sure. want to yeah. do something with you? So the website uh, is uh, shivworks.com. That's mm-hmm. where the training calendar is at. I uh, have a personal Facebook page, Craig Douglas. I have the uh, uh, Shivworks and Shivworks alumni Facebook page. And I'm on Instagram as uh, Southnark, which is my old internet handle. So at Southnark on IG, uh, you can see all the things I'm into, training, food, clothes, you know all that <laughs> stuff and i do like all that stuff too and, so and there's a lot of content on youtube as well right? i have quite a bit of content we have the shivworks media group uh on youtube and then we've got a ton of content we've co-branded with warrior poet society network that's really really well produced and uh you need a subscription to get there i think it's 9.95 a month but if if somebody is really wanting to like look at what I do with Hollywood level production values, uh, a subscription to Warrior Poet Society Network, uh, that's that's well worth the money. Because and there are other people besides me on there. It's a lot of content for the money. Awesome. Yes, sir. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for everything. Thanks Absolutely. for helping the community, thank the whole you. country, right? And Try to. Yeah. So you have a huge part on that. Thank All you, right. sir. I appreciate you. that, Professor. God bless. God bless, well, guys. Take care.